Hey guys, welcome to another essential tutorial. So today I'm going to be showing you how you could do this knitting slash stitching uh, simulation within 3ds Max and Typeflow. Now there's a few ways to do something like this, but hopefully this gives you at least one method and, and helps you out. To get started, you're going to need to have some kind of hatching pattern. Now, of course, you could do this manually by creating lines and, you know, duplicating them across and then uh, duplicating them once more so that you have a horizontal direction and a vertical uh, weaving pattern. But that's, you know, a lot of work and there really isn't much control over um, having any kind of procedural editing ability. So what I did is I used something called MCG Simple Weave um, by Vu Nguyen. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Um, and what I did is I just modified that max creation graph so that I could separate the weave in the horizontal and vertical direction uh, with this check, checkbox toggle here. By default, it comes in like this as just one mesh that's already hatched. Um, but you're going to see why we need to separate these after. You could, of course, not have to modify it and just manually convert it to editable poly and then delete, you know, all the polygons in the X direction and then go ahead, duplicate it and delete all of them in the Y direction. So you have two meshes, one of horizontal and vertical, but that's a lot of work and there really isn't much uh, procedural control over it. What's nice about this uh, max creation graph is it gives you a lot of control over the rows, skew, direction, etc. So let's go ahead and use just the default version of, of this preset. And I'm going to create our first tie flow simulation here. So to get started, what we need for our tie flow simulation is we need to have a box collider object, which I'm going to set as not renderable and display as box. And we want to have it just overlap the lip of the very bottom of this object. And the reason why is because we want to generate particles on just the very bottom edge, wherever it's intersecting with this object. So let's create a birth intersections operator, set it to AB mode, and we're going to create our A object as that horizontal collider box. And our second object we want to have as that uh, horizontal weave mesh. Now we can't go at it just yet. We need to convert it to editable poly. Now, if we go back into our Typeflow simulation, we can uh, add it into the objects B section. Okay, so that's uh, good here. Let's move on. So uh, I'm gonna just move it in, uh, display it as geometry, set it to wireframe and set the uh, particle color here to white. That way you can see what's going on. So wherever this box is intersecting with this weaving mesh, you can see it's generating particles, which is what we want. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a force operator and I'm going to have them push in the X direction along the direction of this mesh. And I'm going to give it a strength of something like 0.2. And uh, one thing I forgot to set here is we need to set it so that start and end only occurs on frame zero so that for one frame, it's generating particles. Then I'm going to create an object bind and I'm going to bind all those particles to that weaving mesh. So if I scrub through this timeline here, you're going to see that if we have it locked to surface, snap to surface, and set the friction to something like five, as we scroll through the timeline, you can see that these particles stick to the mesh as expected. Now using a spline path and a trajectories mode, boom, now we have a weaving pattern of splines. So you can imagine that uh, we're going to need to have some kind of thickness to it. So under the tie splines, let's set the thickness in both parts of, of the modifier to 0 0.05. And on the tie splines portion, you want to enable in viewport so you can see the thickness. So uh, let's disable these two things here. And in order to get this rendering in V-Ray, we need to a uh, way to be able to visualize it. So um, let's add a light here first, just so I can do a test render to see how this looks. Set it to dome. And let's render this out. To render it and see it in our viewport, we're going to need to see a, or we're going to need a mesh operator to have it actually render out in V-Ray. Now, if I hit render, lower down the density of that light, that looks good. So the thing is, I want to actually increase the density of these threads, as this is too sparse. So what we can do is in the birth sections enter, or birth intersections operator, just change the threshold down to something like 0.5. You could, of course, go something down to like 0.1 or even lower, but it's just going to create a lot more simulation time. So for the sake of this tutorial, let's just keep it uh, a bit faster. Now, I'm going to need to duplicate this tie flow simulation and create it for the opposite vertical direction. So I'm going to go ahead and use that uh, max creation graph object. And I want to make sure just to check that box so that it points in the vertical direction and make sure that it's aligned perfectly in the 000 world axis. I'm going to go ahead and copy over that tie flow simulation 
And I just want to disable it for now, just so that I can keep it really fast when changing out all these settings. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to change out the settings to be for this vertical mesh. So I'm going to once again need to have some kind of colliding box set to not render and set display as box. Give it a rename, call it something like vertical collider. And then I'm going to jump into the tie flow settings and I'm just going to switch out these objects. So let's open up the editor here. Under the birth intersections, we're going to need to change out our A and B objects. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's disable this object, switch it out for our vertical box collider. And once again, we need to convert this vertical mesh into editable poly and add that to our objects B list. Under the object bind, we want to have it bind to that vertical mesh object. And under the spline pass, let's go ahead and create a new tie splines object. Uh, I'm going to have it once again be a radius of 0 0.05. And under the tie splines, we want to have it enable in viewport and also have a thickness of 0 0.05. Cool, so one thing I forgot to do here is under tie flow, under the direction of the force, we actually need to have it point in the Y direction this time, not in the direction of X. And so now you can see as I scrub through our timeline, it is now creating a weaved mesh in the Y direction. So now if I uh, go to frame 100 here with both of these enabled, you might have to toggle on and off this birth intersection to have it display properly. Um, you can see that we now have a weaving hatch pattern of a horizontal and vertical uh, splines which is nice because you know there's lots of control over this. You can easily go back and create a new uh, mesh with more rows or more columns. Um, it's just a really nice way to not have to manually model in these splines by hand. So you can't just right click and convert these to splines. We actually have to go into each one of these type of simulations and use the export particles operator to export them as splines. For our final simulation in tie flow, we're gonna need to have these as editable splines before we can input them. So to do that, Using the export particles uh, operator, I'm going to set it to tie cache splines, uh, set the file output directory for both the tie flow one and two, and I'm just going to simply hit generate tie cache files. Now I can go ahead and disable our original tie flow simulations. And with those newly exported tie cache objects, I'm just going to simply right click on them and go convert to editable spline. So now you're going to have two editable spline objects for both the horizontal and vertical direction. And because they're editable splines, I can go ahead and clean these up now, just kind of removing some of these exterior lines so that we only uh, keep the overlapping splines. Just looks a bit cleaner that way. You could of course do something um, as an alternative to this by creating you know, a plane, which is 70 segments in the width direction and use a tie mesh to splines uh, modifier here in order to get you know, splines moving in one direction that way. Simply copy the object and then get them to move in the X direction as well. But of course, you don't get any of this kind of weaving pattern or this overlapping uh, stitch effect. So that's an alternative way you can do it, but I, I prefer to do it this way as I showed you originally. We're going to do our final tie flow simulation here. And to get started, we're going to need to have some kind of colliding object. So I'm going to extend our timeline to 200 frames just so we have a bit more keyframes to work with here. And I'm just gonna animate the radius of this object growing on. And then I'm gonna have our sphere not renderable and display as box. Let's go ahead and create our final tie flow object. So I'm gonna rename this to stitching effect and let's go ahead and set things up. Now I'm gonna disable this and I'm just gonna add in all these operators just to have it not freeze or hang up while it tries to calculate. This will just be a bit faster. Let's use a birth spline and add in those newly created editable spline objects. And I wanna have the percent down to one. We're gonna need a particle bind. And under the particle bind, all I'm gonna change is uh, I want to, under the family bind, let's go bind to siblings and disable enable proximity, proximity bind. What that's gonna do is all these threads are just gonna have a relationship to all the particles that belong to each thread. So um, it'll prevent any kind of threads attaching to each other that don't belong. Uh, we're going to use a surface test so that anything that's near that sphere that uh, animates its radius, once it touches that sphere, it's going to pass on to this event number two here. Um, we're going to also need a spline path set to the mode of siblings so that we can give a thickness to each one of these threads and setting the radius to 0 0.05. And the reason why we have the mode set to siblings is once again that it's only going to give a radius to each one of these threads that are individually connected. Um, let's create a mesh here so it renders. 
In event two now, we're going to have a force. Um, this, is, this is so that once it collides with that sphere, it's going to shoot the threads up uh, in the X direction and give it a bit of noise so that uh, it kind of flies away a bit. And then we're going to have a particle physics object set to an absolute with a radius of 0.2. And we're going to want to ignore the starting penetrations, and then you want to stop ignoring it after the penetrations stop. So we're going to use a slow operator uh, set to the default settings. And finally, we're going to have a surface force operator. Now, what that surface force operator is going to do is kind of act like a black hole, where it's going to suck all those threads that are flying off the ground into it, kind of acting like a vacuum uh, cleaner of some sort. And that's just going to kind of give these really interesting forces that uh, we can then reverse that simulation and have it act like a stitching effect as this mesh is then formed from these threads weaving together. So we're also going to need a spline path, set it to siblings, uh, as we did in the uh, first event. And then finally, we're going to need a mesh. Now, one last thing you could do here is you could use a surface test and you could have basically all the particles that end inside this attracting sphere, uh, we could delete them. And that's just to create uh, a bit of a faster simulation so that we don't have all of these loose particles flying around that aren't visible on camera. Uh, and that was pretty much all I had to do. So if we kind of play through here, we re-enable our Typhlo simulation. Let's see what happens. So that looks a bit uh, crazy. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is to fix this, let's just change it to display small dots. Under the surface force, the force of the attraction is too high. So let's go ahead and reduce that to something like 0.2. And that should help uh, reduce the amount of crazy forces that are happening. And that looks a lot better. As you can see, if we reverse in our timeline, that's going to be kind of the, the normal direction that our animation is going to play. And we could preview with that by going tie flow and hit the reverse option there so we can see what it's going to look like when we play it back. And of course, you could you know, change the position of your colliding object. You could use a texture to drive your collisions. Um, but you know, it just takes a bit of trial and error to get the look that you want. So let's go ahead and export these particles as a tie cache spline. And the reason why we're doing this is just so that we can reverse the keys so that this plays in reverse, basically. So I'm going to go to the tie splines. I'm going to copy this tie spline mesher, and I'm going to paste it over that newly exported tie cache spline sim of our final tie flow simulation. And that'll just give thickness to the threads and allow us to render it out in V-Ray. So coming down to the tie cache spline, in order to have our animation reverse so that the, the loose threads stitch together, I'm going to animate the frame 200 on frame 0, and on frame 200, I'm going to animate the frame at 0 using the tie cache retimer. So that means that our simulation will basically play backwards, which is expected, right? You're going to have these threads come from this chaos flying away, and then they're going to slowly land on the ground, stitching together, which is what you want. Anyway, um, like I said, there's lots of ways to do something like this, but I hope you learned something, and I will see you next time.